We present Anthony Nichols as Dr. Thorndyke and Peter Cook as Marcus Potomac in Mr. Potomac's Oversight, adapted by Molly Hardwick from the novel by R. Austin Freeman. year is 1904. Dr. John Thorndyke is at work in his study in Lincoln's Inn. Sir, Dr. Thorndyke, sir. Mm? Oh, come in, Polton. Excuse me for disturbing you, sir, uh, but I thought I'd better remind you you have not yet had any supper. Oh, dear me, what a memory you have, Polton. Uh, you will not want your desk disturbed. Uh, Inspector, uh, I'd better put your supper in the little laboratory. Yes, that will do admirably. My desk certainly has rather more than its share of paper, now you mention it. Uh, interesting document, sir? I detect a wistful note in your voice, Polton. I must confess to a little curiosity, sir. Well, pray don't apologize. An excellent quality in a laboratory assistant. And not undesirable in a medical legal man, I flatter myself. Which is why you find me studying this role of kinematograph film. Indeed, sir. Mm, very interesting. Over 200 exposures there, I would say. Uh, professional work? No, a talented amateur. My client, Mr. Stalker, has a nephew, one Harold, the inventive genius of the Stalker family, who has invented a remarkable recording camera which will take small photographs in a series and mark each one with its serial number. So that there can be no mistake about the sequence. Exactly. Most ingenious. And this particular role represents... Footprints, Bolton. A great many footprints. Harold Stalker, true to his name, embarked upon the trail of an absconding man, or, or at least a missing one, and it was a chance to show what his camera would do, and he took it. And Mr. Stalker felt it might interest us, I suppose, sir. Quite right, and so it does. I've been looking into the photographs and some other facts and figures, and the result is very interesting, both from our point of view and that of the Griffin Life Assurance Company, to which I have the honour to be advisor. Then I take it we shall be um, following up the trail, Doctor? The trail of the 200 footsteps. Yes, Bolton, we shall. And I think it will shortly lead us to the small village of Borley near Aylesbury. Very good, sir. Mm. It's a queer case, Pelton. Very. But then I live by queer cases. Mm. Soli Auto Speed. DC Dental Packs. At the rising of the sun, hope. At the going down thereof, peace. Having a look oh. at the old sundial, Mr. Oh. Potomac? Yes, Mr. Gallup, I was. I can't resist dropping in at your gate when I'm passing this way. Uh, I always say you can't beat our trade for interest and variety. Nothing like a mason's yard. And as for headstones, you can't beat Gallup's. Look at that marble angel there. Something like a monument she is. Charming. But I still prefer this sundial. A nice bit of carving, that. And wonderful well-preserved. He's counted out a good many hours in his time, he has. <laughs> How old is it? Uh, 1734, it says mm -hmm. here. And ready to count out as many again. No wheels to go rusty. All done with a shadder. No wear and tear about a shadder. <laughs> and never runs down and never wants winding up. All this points about a sundial. Where did it come from? I took it from the garden of Apsley Manor House, what's being rebuilt and brought up to date. And they don't want their sundial? New owner told me to take it away. Had no use for it, he said. So I've got him on my hands. Got him? Oh, <laughs> you mean the sundial? Wouldn't like him for your garden, I suppose, Mr. Potomac. Look lovely there, he would. Fine old garden, that. Best in Borley, I reckon. Well, uh... He's going cheap. Uh, how much? Oh, call it a pound, sir, to you. Done. If you'll bring it along and fix it for me. Oh, I will, sir. Don't want much fixing. You settle where he's to stand. Oh, centre of the lawn, I think. Then I can see it from my windows and from my workshop as well, where I spend so much time at my metal casting and cabinet making. Oh, you'd better prepare the site, then. Dig well down into the subsoil and make a level surface. Then I can put a brick foundation and there'll be no fear of his settling out of the upright. Oh, I enjoy digging. I'll do that tonight and perhaps you can deliver the sundial in the morning. Pleasure, sir. 
You've got a nice sundial there, you have. Ornamental and useful. That's what you'll find him. You see if you don't. Here we are, sir. All present and correct. Ah, nice and early, too, Mr. Gallant. The only trouble is we've struck a snag. Oh, indeed. And what might that be? Well, come here. This is the site I prepared. Oh, very nice. Exactly equidistant. You're a man of precision, Mr. Potomac, like myself. But where's the snag? Under this ball. I dug deep, as you suggested. Now, care to drop this stone down the hole? Oh, if you say so, sir. Bless my life, you've struck a well, sir. Exactly. A very old, very deep well. The water lies 27 feet down by my measuring. That's why I've kept the hole covered. Fancy that now, an old well. I wonder, Mr. Gallat, if this is going to make it impossible to put the sundial here. Oh, no, not at all. It'll hold up the work, though, and be a dearer job. Mm, have to put two biggish slabs over this lot. Oh, I don't mind expense if the dial can go where I want it. But why cover the well at all, sir? A good well's not to be sneezed at if he gets a hard frost and all the pipes he's bunged up and busted. No. It may be very urban of me, but I don't like wells. I wouldn't have an open one in my garden for anything. Then we'll cover it for you. Ah. Two good thick slabs, one atop the other to form a step, and the base of the dial two foot wide. Oh, it had bare St. Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> and when can you fix it? Yeah, let's see, today's Tuesday. Um, shall we say Friday? Friday will do perfectly. Well, I'll be up again on Friday morning. Good day, sir. Good day, Mr. Gallat. The postman's just been with a letter for you, sir. I thought it might be important. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Gadney. Let me see. Oh, no. No, it's not important. Will Mrs. Bellard be coming to tea today, sir? She usually does have a Tuesday. Hmm? Oh, um... Uh, yes, I expect so, Mrs. Gadby. Then I'll make some of those scones she likes. Oh, well, better get it over, I suppose. Dear Jeff. Dear Jeff, he has the affrontery to call me. I send you this little Billy Doo. Deep regret, which I know you'll share, but uh, can't be helped. I had hoped that the last request would have been, in fact, the last one, whereas it turns out to have been uh, the last but one. But it's only a small affair this time, so keep up, Pecker. A hundred. In notes, of course. I'll be the safest. I shall be at the usual place on Wednesday at 8 p.m. This will give you time to hop up to town in the morning and collect the ready. And mind, I've got to have it. No need to dwell on unpleasant alternatives. I'm in the devil of a tight corner, so you've got to help me. So, adieu till Wednesday morning. Yours, till death, Jim Lucy. Positively his final effort. Yes. So was the last one. And the one before that. There's no end to it. None at all. And Alice. How can I ever speak to Alice? That was very charming. I thought it had charmed you into a sort of trance, Mr. Potomac. You look very far away. Oh, did I? How rude of me. I can assure you I wasn't. It would be impossible in your company. <laughs> I enjoy your compliments as much as Mrs. Gadby's con. <laughs> Must be a very vain person. Your piano is so much better than mine. In fact, your house is so much better than mine altogether. Oh, I can't quite agree with that. I may have roses round my porch, but you have a lavender hedge. Planted in 1761. Isn't it curious how we both love old things and places? So many things in common. Yes, we have. Yes. Your pipe 
has gone out. Oh, it always does when my attention is completely occupied. It's curious, isn't it, what power music has to awaken associations? Oh, yes. There's nothing like it, except sense, perhaps. Things utterly unlike anything but themselves seem to have a power that things like pictures lack. I feel that, too. I, I've been trying to remember something only today. Or someone, rather. Really? Yes, someone you remind me of. You're much older, of course. Oh, I'm sorry for him, poor chap. Except that he's a friend of yours, of course. He isn't. Not now. He's dead. Then I'm even sorrier for him. Won't you play to me again? Of course. It's a joy to play to a sympathetic listener. Now, fill your pipe and I'll play you some of the things that I like playing to myself. And that you must like, too, because I do. And because you're unhappy today. Thank you, Mrs. Bellard. Please, can't it be Alice? Alice. Who's that? Oh, I think you know who it is, old man. Oh, yes, I was expecting you. Come into the summer house. Come into the garden, Lord, for the blackbird night is quiet, flown. Quiet, quiet. My housekeeper will hear you. Oh, now, Jeff, you don't seem to be overjoyed to see me. Won't you shake hands with an old pal? No. Come inside. Oh, very cosy in here. Mm. <sighs> well, what about a mild refresher, eh? Just while we discuss business. Oh, come on. I know you keep a bit in here. Very well. Whiskey. Neat, I believe. Of course. <clears throat> You're not going to join me, Jeff? No. I only drink with friends. And don't call me Jeff. Oh, all right, then. Marcus. <laughs> Funny name, Marcus, isn't it? A brand, or rather, a Brandon snatched from the burning. Can we discuss the matter that brought you here, Lucy? After I've had my drink. Mm. Now, it's a little state, this, for an ex. You know what? I've worked for it honestly. Oh, of course, of course, we know. Mm. Been digging up your lawn, I see. Going to set up a flag, star? No, I'm going to have a sundial there. Oh, a sundial, eh? Mm. Going to get your time on the cheap, eh? <laughs> I suppose you'll have a motto on it. Tempest Fugit's the usual thing, always appropriate, but particularly so in the case of a man who's done time and fugitive. Eh? You come to the point. Anyway, well, you got my letter, I suppose? Yes. Been up to town today? No. Well, I suppose you've got the money. No, I haven't. But hang it, man, didn't I tell you it was urgent? I've got to pay that hundred tomorrow. As I haven't got the money, I've got to borrow it from you know where. And I've got to put it back at once. No good, Lucy. It can't be done. It can't be done? What the devil do you mean? I mean this. I'm going to hold you to your agreement or part of it. You demanded a sum of money as the price of your silence about my past. It was to be a single payment, and I paid it. Within a couple of months, you made another demand, and I paid again. Since then, you've made demands at intervals in spite of your solemn undertaking. Now, this has got to stop. There must be an end to it. Very well, Jeff. Just tell me out this time and you'll hear no more from me. It's no good, Lucy. You said that last time and the time before that. If I let you, you'll go on till you've squeezed me dry. If you let me, how do you think you're going to prevent me? Look here, young fellow, my lad. If that money isn't handed out to me tomorrow morning, something's going to happen. Oh, what? A very surprised gentleman at Scotland Yard will get a letter informing him that the late Geoffrey Brandon, runaway convict, supposed dead during flight, is not the late J.B., but is alive and kicking, and at present living under the name of Marcus Potomac, Esquire, with his hair bleached white and a pair of plain spectacles on his nose. There, now, how will that suit you? It wouldn't suit me at all. But before you do it, may I remind you of one or two things? First, the runaway convict who was once your best friend. 
was an innocent man. That's no affair of mine. The jury found him guilty. Don't talk rubbish, Lewison. We both know that I didn't do those forgeries, and we both know who did. Give us another drink. If you knew who did it, then you must have been a blooming mug not to tell. I didn't know then. I thought you were honest. Ah, oh, well, we live and learn, don't we? <laughs> it's stuffy in here. Let's get out into the garden. Have a walk, eh? Are you sure you can walk? Hmm. Nice smell, roses. Uh, oh, come on, old man. Let, let, let's just let's let's settle this amicably, just like old pals, eh? You, you just help me out of this hole, and I'll give you my solemn word of honour. It'll be the very last time. Well, well, what do you say? I say that I'm not going to give you another farthing on any condition whatsoever. Oh, you're not, aren't you? Well, we'll see about that. You'll either pay me, or else I'll take off my coat and give you the finest hammering you've ever had in all your life. Will you? Yes, I will, you little little whippersnapper, you. And what I've done with you, I'll have to turn up your fingerprints to find out who you are. Can you hear me? I'm listening. Well, you're going to pay up or take a hammering? Neither, thank you. All right, watch out, then. Right. Oh! Ah. You little swine, you hit me. Now, pull yourself together. You're drunk. Drunk, am I? Right, we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. I'll... I'll... <coughs> Had enough, Newson? No, damn you. I'll teach you. I've got you now. I'll throttle you. No, you won't. Newson, look out! Newson! Newson! My God! Mr. Polymac, planted nicely, yes. And if the mortar isn't disturbed till it's had time to set, he won't want touching again for a century or two. No. No, of course not. You get a bit of smooth turf round him and a few flowers, he'll be as safe as houses. Yes, he will. I mean, it will. You've made a very nice job of it, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, sir. Well, I'll be on my way. Oh, I suppose you know about the young gent outside your gate taking photographs of the ground. Hmm? Of the ground? Ah, the path. Seems as there's some footmarks there. It's them he's a taking. But what for? Oh, I don't know, but I got my ideas. I suspect it's something to do with that bank manager that I was telling you about. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Lucen. There's no news of him, and he was seen coming this way Wednesday night. Why, he must have passed this very gate. Dear me. A little more port, Doctor? Thank you, Bolton. I think I will. An excellent bottle. The 70, isn't it? Yes, sir. And for you, Superintendent? I think so, yes. If your cellar can spare it, Thorndyke. The entertainment of Scotland Yard, and especially of my old friend, Superintendent Miller, my cellar is as boundless as the sea. <laughs> The more I have, the more I give to thee, for both are infinite. The Bard of Avon, sir. Romeo and Juliet. Quite correct, Poulton. Can't fault him on a quotation, Miller. No, the bloom inside more than me, does Poulton. It was Dr. Thorndyke gave me my scholarship, sir. But for him, I'd have been a poor lad in a workshop with neither place nor learning. But why discern your native genius, Poulton, and selfishly harnessed it to my own trade? Uh, speaking of which... You studied those footprint photographs, Miller? Well, I have. But they don't tell me much. What have we got? 200 numbered photographs of footprints taken on the second morning of the disappearance. Photographs accompanied by a 25-inch ordnance map on which each footprint was indicated by a numbered dot. A row of dots started at the bank, became lost in streets, entered and followed a footpath which passed along a garden wall in which was a gate continued through fields to a point at which they stopped. Exactly. Yet a careful examination of those photographs led me to believe that the missing man had entered the gate in that garden wall and uh, never come out again. Hmm? 
How do you work that out? Because I am convinced that this was not a single series of footprints made by one man, but two series made by two different men. The first series ended at the gate, the second series started at the gate and ended in the field. Then the footprints weren't all alike. Well, it depends what you mean by alike. Perhaps Poulton can tell us why a man wears circular rubber heels. I wear them myself, sir. If I wear ordinary leather ones, I wear them out, all down the side. And how do the circular heels help you? Hmm? In circular heels, the whir does not occur all at one point, but is distributed throughout the whole circumference. Exactly. A circular heel is secured to the shoe by a single central screw. But it is not a complete fixture. As the wearer walks, the impact of the ground causes it to creep round. Well, of course, but... uh... In the first set of footprints, up to the garden gate, the heels are shown to be rotating regularly. Then an astonishing thing happens. Both heels suddenly cease to revolve. They stop dead, and at the same place. The garden gate. Just so. Now, revolving heels do not suddenly cease to revolve. The only explanation that I can think of is that the prints in the second series were made not by the shoes themselves, but by... That plaster cast. Ridiculous. No, Poulton follows my train of thought perfectly. And I ask myself, if the missing man had entered that garden gate and been made away with, why did the murderer not simply take the shoes off the corpse and put them on his own feet? The answer is that the shoes were not available. Then I expect the fairies spirited the corpse away and the robins buried him under the leaves. Oh, I'm sorry, Thorndyke, but your arguments are a bit too involved for me tonight. I'll let you know if there are any developments in the case. Well, I shall be anxious to know. Good night, Superintendent. Good night, Doctor. Thank you for an excellent dinner. All right, folks, and I'll see myself. Ah, uh, Will you pack me a small bag, Bolton? Yes, sir. And the research case? No. Merely the one-inch ordnance map. Call me a cab at eight o'clock tomorrow. For the Borley train, sir? For the Borley train. Good morning. Morning. Uh, Would you be so good as to tell me the way to the chestnuts? That gate there, in front of you. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you. Don't apologize, I beg you. In fact, I should apologize for disturbing you at your gardening, but um, I heard you singing and came in. No, no, you're not disturbing me. How can I help you? I wonder if you could tell me the way to Potter's Wood. Potter's Wood? Oh, yes. The lane outside leads to it, about half a mile further on. Uh, Where does it lead to eventually? It crosses the fields and joins a by-road to the main London road. Was that where you wanted to go? No, no. It's the part itself I'm concerned with. The fact is, I'm making a sort of informal inspection in connection with the case of a man who disappeared a short time ago. The um, the manager of a local branch of Perkins Bank. Oh, yes, I remember. Uh, is he still missing, then? Yes, yes, he is. Uh, what is Potter's Wood like? Is it a place where a man might lose himself? No, it's only a small wood. Uh, Has it been searched? I really can't say. It certainly ought to have been. I thought, perhaps, that you were connected with the police. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a lawyer. I look after some of the affairs of Perkins Bank. Uh, As I happen to be in the district, I thought I would come and take a look round. I see. Yes. Perhaps you could show me where we are on my map. Uh, It's a little confusing to a stranger, you know, especially a citified stranger. Of course. May I... Thank you. Now, um... Hmm. This dotted line seems to be the footpath. Ah, this black dot must be my house. Yes, um, here's the wood with the dotted line running through it. Ah, yes, thank you. Ah, now my way is clear. I'm very greatly obliged to you, Mr... Potomac. Marcus Potomac. Uh, don't forget your map. Mm-hmm. Oh, my map. Oh, to be sure. I was going without it. Thank you, sir. Oh, oh, oh. D- I am so sorry. You, your spec. No, it isn't. <laughs> Perfectly all right. They fell on the grass. How extremely clumsy of me. I am so glad they're unbroken. 
Well, once again, Mr. Potomac, thank you for your help and for a glimpse of your charming garden, especially that fine sundial you're past. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Good day. Good day. sort of a lawyer. Come in. Uh, Dr. Thorndyke to see you, sir. Ah, good morning, Doctor. Good morning, Superintendent. Sit down, won't you? Thank you. Well, the mountain has come to Mohammed, you see, my dear Miller. Here I am in the sacred precincts of Scotland Yard. Mm. And what assistance can we give you? In other words, what mess do you want us to help you out of? Oh, tut, tut. I merely want you to glance at these photographs. Hmm? Fingerprints? Yeah. The thumb and first two fingers of the left hand. Well, what about it? I suppose you want us to tell you whose fingerprints they are. And you want to gammon us that you don't know already. Exactly the position. I, I don't want to give details, but if my suspicions are correct, these are the fingerprints of a gentleman who may have been known to the police at some time. I hope so. I'll be wasting our efforts looking for them. They may even be the prince of a man who has been dead for some years. <laughs> dead? Good Lord, Doctor, what a vindictive fellow you are. But you don't suppose we follow the criminal classes into the next world, do you? Uh, indeed, no, but I assume that you don't destroy records. Well, in the main, that's true. We don't keep the whole set of documents of a dead man, but we have a set of skeleton files. Good phrase, that. Grimly appropriate. <laughs> With personal details, prince photographs description, preserved. Can you give us the slightest idea of the date? Well, shall we say, um, 11 years ago? Speaking very roughly, of course. Well, Doctor, here's your information, all in black and white. He seemed to have kept the whole of his papers for some reason. And the name? Brandon. Geoffrey Brandon. Will that do for you? Very nicely, thank you. Here's his photograph. Good-looking fellow, isn't he? Delicate sort of face, like one of those old Roman heads. Mm, classical, yes. Very a remarkably elegant and unusual Grecian nose. And his case history? Well, it's all there, and you can take it into the waiting room and read it to your heart's content. But as it happens, I remember a good deal about this man. Oh, that's fortunate. Yeah. I had to turn the case up in connection with something else. Can't recall what. Forgery business, 1893. Series of forgeries at Perkins Bank, the Cornhill branch. All very clever, very knowledgeable. Series of forged bearer checks, all presented and paid at the counter of this man, Brandon. Interesting and significant. Yes. As soon as the discovery was made, the whole staff was searched, of course, as everything pointed to an inside job. They found three forged bearer checks in a letter case in Brandon's greatcoat pocket. He denied guilt, I suppose. Oh, he knew nothing about it, so the checks had been planted... But they found him guilty and he got five years. And died in prison, I take it. Oh, no. He died escaping from prison. Oh? Yeah, soon after his conviction, he was sent to the convict jail at Coalport. While he was working outside with a gang, he slipped past the civil guard and made off along the sea wall. When they found his tracks and followed them, there were his clothes on the mudflats and some footprints leaning out to sea. Dear me. They assumed he'd, he'd swum out to some passing vessel, which is probably what he tried to do. But about six weeks later, his body was found in a creek some miles down the coast. Really? It was identified, I suppose. Mm, pretty far gone, I gather, from these notes. But obviously it was Brandon's body. Naked man missing, naked man's body washed ashore. Just where he was expected to wash ashore. Of course. Well, this is all very interesting, my dear Miller. Yes, what interests me is where you got those prints and what you needed them for. Ah, the prints. Well, um, I got them from a connection of poor Geoffrey Brandon's, and as for my intentions towards them, may we put that down as a professional signal? <laughs> I know you and your devious ways. Tell you what, though, it it's odd you to bring up the name of Perkins Bank this morning, is it? Why? Because I've just had a report from the bank where that man Lucen worked to say that Lucen had walked off with a hundred pounds of the bank's money the night he disappeared. Had he indeed? And no trace of Lucen has come to light. Not a hair of him. Well, Doctor, uh, well, you want to read these papers on Brandon, because if so, the waiting room's yours. No, thank you. For the moment, let us leave Brandon to rest.
At the rising of the sun, hope. At the going down thereof, peace. You sound as though you liked the motto, Alice. Oh, it's beautiful. The first part is what we all know by experience. The second part is what we pray for, to make up for the sorrows and disillusionments of the years that lie between. Yes. Yes. A sundial is a comforting object. I thought you were never going to invite me to see it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be... Well, I, I would have asked you before, but I... I've um, had a lot of things to see to, things on my mind. You know how I enjoy your visits, Alice. I know. Well, I'm glad to be here now and see the famous object at last. How strange to think there's a well underneath. Oh, deliciously horrible. Why horrible? Oh, don't you think wells are gruesome things? I do. There's one in my garden and it makes me shiver whenever I lower the bucket and watch it sinking down, down that black hole into the earth. Yes, I have that feeling myself. Probably most town-bred people have. And wells really are rather dangerous. That's why I had this one covered up. Very wise. And those are your workshops, aren't they? How cleverly you've disguised them with trellis and climbers. May I look in? Please, they'll be most honoured. Here we are. How splendid. And what a range of things. A joiner's bench, a forge, a lathe, an emery wheel, mm. plaster of Paris. What a versatile workman you must be. And what a knowledgeable lady you must be to recognize <laughs> them all. Well, I think women should know far more than they're supposed to know and be able to earn their own livings at many trades. If I had not been left a small legacy, I should be very poor and helpless now. No, Alice. Never, if I I'm could... I'm glad I've seen the place where you work. Now I can picture you to myself busy and happy. You are happy when you're working here, aren't you? Isn't every workman happy when he's working? I expect so. And you have so many skills in your hands. Well, I had to turn my hand to most things when I was in America. Making my fortune, as they say. But you didn't stay there. You came back to England. What brought you back? Hope, perhaps. Hope? Of what? Of regaining something. Security, happiness, home. Well, you have the security and the home. But the happiness, I wonder. You always seem very cheerful. Yet, yet sometimes I think you're not really happy. You're right, Alice. My life is incomplete, and all these hobbies of mine are only makeshifts to fill a blank. But it could easily be made complete. Marcus. A word from you would be enough. If you were my wife, Alice, there'd be nothing left in the world for me to want. Oh, my dear... Why not, Alice? We're the very best of friends. We like the same things and the same way of life, and I... I love you very much, Alice though I haven't said so before because of other reasons which are gone now. Won't you say yes? Marcus. Dear Marcus, I would say yes joyfully, thankfully, if only it were possible. But it isn't. I can't be your wife. But why? What prevents you? My husband. Your, your husband? Yes. Oh, you believe that I'm a widow, so does everyone here. I'm not. My husband is still alive, though I won't live with him or acknowledge him. Oh, Marcus, dear, don't look so stricken. Come and sit down and I'll tell you the whole wretched story. Yes, tell me. Well, when I was a young woman... I was engaged to a young man named Geoffrey Brandon. You're shivering, Marcus. What's the matter? Nothing. A goose walking over my grave. Go on. It's odd talking about Geoffrey to you because you're so extraordinarily like him. You look much older, of course, but apart from that, you might be his twin. That's what attracted me to you from the first. I'm glad. Geoffrey worked in a bank. We were going to get married. Then 
everything finished. A most dreadful thing happened. A series of forgeries was discovered at the bank and suspicion fell on Geoffrey. He was convicted and sentenced to five years in prison. But you didn't believe him guilty. Of course not. I knew him. Well, he was silly enough to escape from his guards while he was in a working party and in trying to swim out to a ship he was drowned. I went to the inquest, but... Oh, I don't want to talk about it. No, don't try, my dear. After Geoffrey died, I thought, of course, that I'd never marry, but things worked out differently. Geoffrey had one close friend at the bank, a clerk called James Lewson. Lewson? This man, Lewson, came to see me often after Geoffrey's death and kept saying how much he believed in Geoffrey's innocence. Naturally, I was drawn to him for this, as everyone else seemed to take the poor boy's guilt for granted. Then he became more and more friendly, and finally he asked me to marry him. True friendship. Well, at last, I gave way. I must have been quite mad. No, only very young. Then, of course, disillusionment came. When I found out that James knew I had a little legacy coming to me, he began to gamble on the strength of it and to drink as well. But by the time I came into my legacy, I knew him for what he was, and I saw to it that my money was tied up in a trust. And then he did something very foolish. One day when he was drunk, he spoke disrespectfully about Geoffrey and boasted to me, to me, that he had been the real forger and the one who had falsely incriminated Geoffrey. And you found yourself married to a criminal, a traitor and a liar. Yes, but not for long. I told him that we must separate at once completely that I was going to take my mother's maiden name, Bellard, and pretend to be a widow, and that he should agree not to molest me or even to appear to recognise me in the street if we met. On those conditions, I paid him a quarterly allowance and agreed to take no action about what he told me. More than he deserved. Perhaps so. But I wanted to avoid trouble. Well, I left London after a time and found this cottage in Borley. In about a year... I had a letter from James saying that by a strange coincidence he'd been appointed manager of the Borley branch. Of course, he'd engineered it himself. Why, do you suppose? Oh, it may have been malice just to annoy me without breaking the agreement, but I think it was done to keep me in a state of nervous unrest so that when he came to me for money, I should be more ready to pay. You can imagine what a relief it was to me when he disappeared. I can indeed. What do you think has become of him? I can't imagine. It's most mysterious. And perhaps the most mysterious thing is that he's never applied to me for money since he vanished. Oh, do you think he may have gone abroad? Oh, why should he have done? It's even possible that he may be dead. Yes? But what's the use of guessing? Well, I was only thinking that if he should happen to have died, that would dispose of our difficulties. Oh, not unless we knew that he was dead. If he were dead and his death was never proved, or if he died without being identified, then I should be bound to him as much as ever. But if it should ever become known as a fact that he was dead, then would you say yes, Alice? Marcus, dear. If I were free, I'd gladly, thankfully take you for my husband. Thank you for saying that, at least. Supposing he were dead... Oh, what's the use of supposing it when there's no reason to... I only wish he were dead. He ruined poor Geoffrey's life and he's ruined mine and now you are. Only part of our lives, surely. We can still salvage something, Alice. Yes, you're right. We can still be friends, as we can't be anything else. That's all I ask. It's all I can ask. me, what a very pleasant prospect. Pelton, I cannot imagine why anyone ever visits London during the week when it's so charming on Sunday. I fancy the same might apply to most large towns, Doctor. Yes, you're probably right. The absence of people renders any street singularly attractive. Oh, but that is a cynical observation, and I really must do some work. 
Superintendent Miller has sent over all the papers on the Lucent case, sir, before the file is closed. Oh, thank you, Pelton. Hmm. Letter found addressed to Lucen, opened by the police. Dear Lucen, I think it necessary to tell you plainly that this can't be allowed to go on. If the amount, £97.14 and fourpence, is not paid within 48 hours, I shall have to take measures that, etc., 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 yours faithfully, Louis Bateman. The gentleman seems to have got himself into debt. Yes. He seems to have dropped over £600 in the last 12 months. A shocking amount, Doctor. It is indeed. Particularly for a man earning only 600 a year, as Lucent did. Now... Where did he get the money for his speculations? Sums always paid to the broker in cash. If I may say so, Doctor, it sounds as though the late Mr. Lucen might have been rather a fishy customer. Exactly my own conclusion, Pelton. But let us not call him the late at this stage. Oh, too early to presume death, sir? Too early? My dear Pelton, if you take the trouble to study the law relating to the presumption of death, you will find that in 1850, the Court of Queen's Bench refused to presume the death of a person known to have been alive in 1027. <laughs> Good gracious, sir. So you see, in order to presume death, we must have a body. And if we can't produce a body, the thing is quite impossible. If you please, ladies and gentlemen, we come now to lot 15, a most interesting item. And so far in this sale of items from Professor Macquarie's valuable collection, we've had mainly familiar domestic items from ancient Egypt. Now we come to an Egyptian mummy. Yes, this remarkable lot is described in your catalogues as mummy of an official with portions of wooden coffin. Label on coffin gives name of deceased as... Karma Heru, a libationer of the 19th or 20th dynasty. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, what a sensational and indeed awesome object you may become the fortunate possessor of. Now, who'll start the bidding? <coughs> uh, well, come, come. This is not at all what I expected. Egyptian mummy, high ranking temple official, fine state of preservation, only a few trifling restorations needed. Why, you could dress him up in your uncle's coat and hat and he'd pass for a living man. At least for one that hadn't been dead very long. <laughs> mm. Well, really, now, this won't do. Can't I have a few bits for this unique object? Who'll start it now? You, madam. Ten shillings. Ten shillings? It's worse than ridiculous. It's irreverent. You over there, sir. Fifteen. Any advance on 15 shillings? A pound. Go in for a pound. Any advance on 20 shillings? Very well, then. Lot 15 goes for one pound to the gentleman with the grey hair and spectacles. One pound. Thank you, sir. Will you be sending for the coffin or take it with you? Oh, I'll take it. It should go easily on the roof of a cab. I'll send the boy out with it. Your receipt, sir, made out to Mr... Potomac. M. Potomac. Mr. Potomac? Mr. Potomac? Oh, there you are, sir. What is it, Mrs. Gadby? Only that I can't find the key of the tool house. I thought you might have it in your pocket, sir. The key... Oh, yes, to be sure. Um, what do you want it for? Well, there's a nasty nail come up point forwards right in the middle of the kitchen floor, and I wanted to hammer it down so nobody would injure themselves. Oh, I see. Yes, well, I have the key on me, but as it happens, I'd rather you didn't go in because I've got some, um, some rather noxious artificial manure in there which I'm keeping for compost. Oh, very well, sir. But what about the hammer? Oh, there's a spare one in my workshop, I think. I'll go and get it for you. Oh, oh, uh, Mrs. Gadby, I shan't be wanting any supper tonight. No supper, sir, when I've got two nice special mutton chops. Why ever not? I'm doing some very difficult work in my workshop tonight. Something that needs time and, um, 
concentration. Well, if you say so, sir, but it isn't healthy in my opinion. Why, if you go on like that, you'll be little more than a skeleton. That's what I say, though I may be old-fashioned. Here you are. And pretty horrible you look, I must say. But convincing enough, I think, by the time you've lain out in Potter's Wood for six months or so. Now, let me see. Is there anything I've forgotten? Pin-headed worsted waistcoat. Mm-hmm. Plain grey cotton shirt. Spotted necktie. Yes, it's just as well they published a detailed description. Underclothing, Mark J.L., Lucent's own jacket with some letters in the pockets. Yes, I think that's about all. Well, if you don't convince them the villain's dead, nothing will. It's taken me six weeks to transform you into James Lucent. And I flatter myself you're a work of art. Now all I've got to do is to get you to Potter's Wood. Somehow. And may heaven send me a dark night. Oh, oh, Mr. Gallet. Startled you, did I, sir? Well, uh, uh, <coughs> yes, I I suppose my thoughts were elsewhere. Uh, you don't expect to meet anyone round here this time of night, do you? Uh, uh, I certainly didn't. How I come to be walking in Potter's Wood, you see, we've been doing a job over at Aylesbury. And to the side of the London road, oh, Bessie, she went lame. That's my mare. Oh, poor creature. So I says to Jim, my oldest boy... You stay here with Bessie, I says, and give her a good rest, and I'll take the shortcut home through Potter's Wood and reassure your ma neither of us is injured. Not that I likes these places at nights, Mr. Potomac. Hmm? Oh, no, 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 not, not at all. A lot of poachers about, and folk like that as a knock a honey's man on the head if they thought he'd seen them at their fell work. Hey, why, sir, that's a big sack you got there. Hmm? This? Oh, uh, well, yes, it is, rather, I suppose. You've been out after rabbits, like them we was mentioning just now. <laughs> if so, I reckon I ought to demand one as ransom, like. Oh, yes. Yes, certainly. And uh, if that were the case, I should give you one with pleasure, Mr. Gallat. But it, it isn't, of course. Well, I didn't hardly think it was. Uh, if that sack had been crammed with rabbits, he'd have shown traces, wouldn't he? With blood and the like. And what's more, you'd have a gun with you. No, Mr. Gallet, the fact is, I'm after moths and snails. Well, there now. Yes, I do a bit of collecting, you know, among my other hobbies, and I find a good many specimens about here. There are a tremendous number of different snails, if you take the trouble to look for them. Ah. I never noticed but the crawling kind. Well, they all crawl, I suppose. However, you see, to collect them and... Um, lay bait for them and so on, I need quite a lot of equipment. And, of course, for the moth catching, I carry an inspection lamp and um, uh, other things. Uh, To be sure, sir. And a very pretty hobby. Well, I must be on my way. Oh, how is that sundial of yours working? Oh, splendidly, thank you. Plenty of sun this summer for it to work with. Ah, that's so. But autumn's on us now. Good night, sir. Good night. Thank heaven it was only Gallus. Well, try again. Who's that? Who's there? Well, there you are, Kamehiro. 
decently buried again in a gravel pit in an English wood instead of an Egyptian pyramid. The winds will come and the leaves pile up on you. And if I've any luck, they'll think that you were killed by a fall of gravel. Goodbye. Rest in peace. I'm Kama Hero. Please forgive me. Mr. Potomac, here's Mrs. Bellard to see you. I mean, quite a taking, if you ask me. Please show her in, Mrs. Gabby. It's all right, Mrs. Gabby. I am in. Shall I bring you and Mrs. Bellard some sherry, sir, seeing as it's still cold these mornings in spite of a late Easter? Yes, that would be nice, Mrs. Gabby. Thank you. Marcus, have you heard about James, I mean? James? You... You don't mean to say that fellow has turned up again? Then you haven't heard. He's... Dead, Marcus. They found his body yesterday evening. The news is all over the town this morning. Good heavens. This is news with a vengeance. Where was he found? Oh, quite near here. In a gravel pit in Potter's Wood. He must have fallen into it the very night he went away. Then he's been lying there all these months. But uh, I suppose there's no doubt it is Lucen's body. Oh, not in the least. Of course, the body itself was quite unrecognizable. They say it. It actually dropped to pieces when they tried to pick it up. Isn't it horrible? But the police were able to identify it by the clothes and some papers and the pockets. Otherwise, there was nothing left but the bones. It makes me shudder to think of. Yes, it does sound rather unpleasant. But it might have been worse. He might have turned up alive. Now you're rid of him for good. Oh, I know. It's, it's an enormous relief. But still... What ought I to do, Marcus? Do? Yes. After all, he was my husband. What do you suppose you ought to do? Well, don't you think that somebody belonging to him ought to come forward to... to identify him? But my dear, you can't identify his bones. You've never seen them. Besides, you say he's been identified already. Well, then, to acknowledge him. My dear Alice, why on earth should you acknowledge him when you repudiated him years ago? No, no, no. You just keep quiet and let things take their course. Think of all the scandal and gossip that would start if you were suddenly to announce yourself as Mrs. Lucy. Yes, I suppose so. You're still willing to marry me, dear, aren't you? You know I am, but don't let's talk about it now. No, I don't want to, but we have to settle this other thing. Suppose we were to marry in the reasonably near future. If you had made known the fact that you were Lucy's wife... And if it should turn out that Lucen met his death by foul means, what do you imagine people would say then? Of course. They'd say we'd conspired to get him out of the way. Oh, Marcus, you are clever. I, I'm glad I came and consulted you. Sherry for you, sir and madam, and ratify biscuits. Oh, thank you so much, Mrs. Gadby. Put it down there, please. I suppose it would be callous and, and a bit wicked to drink a toast to us, Marcus. My dear, I think it might be. Let's say instead, to hope. To hope. An inquest on the body is to be held at the Town Hall Borley on Thursday next at 3 p.m., when the mystery of the disappearance and death will no doubt be elucidated. Oh. Well, Fulton, 
There's your fishy customer run to earth at last. Yes, Doctor. But you don't sound as if you'd quite the same opinion as the reporter had. Your detective instincts are growing, Poulton. I haven't. Then you don't think he... I don't think anything at the moment. Except that if this is indeed James Lewson's body, my previous conclusions have been sadly mistaken. Then no crime may have been committed? I fear a serious crime may have been committed, Poulton. If not two crimes. Hmm. Then, um, shall you be going down to the inquest, sir? Almost certainly, unless I have any previous engagements for Thursday. Oh, none that can't easily be put off. I particularly wish to go, Poulton, because this item of news has rather changed my position with regard to this case. How, Doctor, if I may ask? All I can tell you at the moment is that hitherto my attitude to it has been that of a spectator, of, a, of an academic investigator at the most. Now I feel it may be my duty to take a more active interest, both as a citizen and an officer of the law. I see, Doctor. Um, then we shall be travelling on Thursday morning. We, Poulton? Well, I thought perhaps uh, your research case and any documents, uh, I might come in useful. But if you would rather I remained here... No, 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 of course you shall come. And now if you will kindly take this brief round to Mr. Anstey and tell him I've made a few notes on it for his benefit. Yes, sir. Looking for someone, were you? Oh, good afternoon, Sergeant. Yes, I was hoping to have a word with Mr. Browning, the coroner. Here's my car. Oh, yes, sir, I see. That'll be all right. I'll take you up to his office. It's on the floor above this. Oh, excuse me. This is indeed an unexpected pleasure, Dr. Thorndyke. And a great honour, if I may say so. Oh, most kind of you, Mr. Browning. Uh, may I introduce my assistant, Mr. Pelton? Uh, how do you do? How do you do, sir? Now, press it down. Thank you. Well, have you come down to lend us a hand in solving the mystery, Doctor? Oh, is there a mystery? Well, no, there isn't. Except how the poor fellow came to be wandering about the wood in the dark. But I take it from your being here that you're in some way interested or concerned in the case? Well, not in the case, uh, only in the body. Indeed. And my interest in that is rather academic. I understand that it's known to have been lying exposed in the open for nine months. Now, I have never had an opportunity of inspecting a body that has been subjected to those conditions. And so I, I, I thought I would ask your kind permission to look it over and make a few notes. <laughs> I see. So that you may know exactly what a nine-month-old exposed body looks like with a view to future contingencies. <laughs> I would hardly put it so carelessly, Mr. Browning. But uh, seriously, have you any objection? My dear doctor, of course, I should be delighted to help you. Uh, would you like to make your inspection now? Well, how would that suit you? Oh, perfectly. The jury will be going in to view the remains in about half an hour. But it won't um, interfere with your proceedings. In any case, you'll probably be finished by then. Are you coming to the inquest? I, I should like to. The evidence may help me to amplify my notes. Then I'll see that a chair is kept for you. And now I'll tell Sergeant Tatnall to take you to the mortuary and see that you and Mr. Poulton are not disturbed while you're making your notes. That's it. I'll have to stay at the door if it's all the same to you, sir, in case any of the public try to get in. Well, that's quite all right, Sergeant Tatnall. Uh, I should say they would be very ill-advised if they did, wouldn't you, Bolton? Very, Doctor. Horrible, isn't it? Unpleasant, yes, but interesting. Now, let us look at the deceased. Here is the pile of clothing I see. Uh, may I have the police description of Lucen? Um, here, sir. Thank you. Now, frieze jacket, pin-headed worsted waistcoat and trousers, grey cotton shirt, yes, yes, underclothing mark J.L., yes, that all seems to agree. Now, contents of the pockets. Uh, visiting cards, James Lucen, Perkins Bank, High Street, Borley, letters, letter from the broker Bateman, Demand from bookmaker, laundry bill, tailor's bill, leather cigarette case, handkerchief. Hmm. No keys. That's curious. A man who goes about without keys is going to find it difficult to open his own front door. Perhaps he had a landlady and she always let him in. Possible, but unlikely. And no loose money, you observe. 
In fact, the items are missing which would be most probably kept in a trouser pocket, as apart from the pockets of a coat or jacket. Does this suggest anything to you, Poulton? No, Doctor. What ought it to suggest? Well, to me, it has a very strong implication that the body is not wearing its own trousers. Ah, yes. But let us proceed. Oh. Ah, the shoes. The rubber-soled shoes of which we have so many excellent photographs. Yeah, may I see those pictures again? I, I have them here. Oh, thank you. Mm. Yes, yes. There is the distinctive sole pattern, even the small knife cut on the right sole. You would say those were the same, Poulton? Oh, confidently. Then you would be wrong. Hmm? The central screws in the heels have their slots at a totally different angle from those in the photographs. In this picture of the right foot, you will see that the slot of the screw is in the position of the hands of a clock at a quarter to three. Mm, that's right. Whereas in the actual shoe, the slot is in the position of five minutes past seven. Now, the screws cannot have moved themselves. Therefore, these are not the shoes which made those footprints. Oh, dear me. Mm. Now, let us look at the body. Mm -hmm. Ah, a sad and gruesome sight, Poulton. If you would rather wait outside... Uh, no, no, I, I, I'll be all right, thank you, Doctor. It's, I, I've seen worse. Yes, well, the description again, please. Well, um, mm. here it is. The height and general measurement seems to agree, yes. So far as one can tell, it's difficult, though... Pity there's not more... Hello. What is it, sir? The nails. Do you see anything odd about them, Pope? Your eyes are younger than mine. A sort of orangey-yellow colour, you mean, sir? That's right. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. I think, Poulton, that this case is going to prove even stranger than it first appeared. really wise to stick together, Marcus. Oh, I see no reason why not. People know we're friends. It would look odd if we sat separately. You're probably right. Oh, look, there's Mr. Browning coming in. I know his wife. She's in the ladies' working party at church. Who's that with him, I wonder? Uh, which one? The tall, grey-haired man with the kind face. Perhaps he's an expert they've called in. Marcus, what's the matter? You look quite pale. Uh, it's nothing, Alice. I, um, just a stab of, uh, Indigestion or something. Yes, he must be an expert. Mr. Browning is consulting. Just before we start, Dr. Thorndyke, you um, had a good look at the body. I made a thorough examination, thanks to you, Mr. Browning. Then would it be fair for me to ask you a question? Well, perhaps I could hear the question. Well, the medical witness I'm calling is a police surgeon's locum tenens. I don't know much about him, but I suspect that he hasn't had much experience. He tells me that he can find nothing definite to indicate the cause of death. What do you say to that? It is exactly what I should have said myself in his place. Thank you. Thank you. You set my mind at rest. Now, it's time we started. Now, gentlemen of the jury, the inquiry which we're about to conduct concerns the most regrettable death of a fellow townsman of yours, Mr. James Lucent, who, as you probably know, disappeared rather mysteriously on the night of July 23rd last year. Quite by chance, his dead body was discovered last Monday afternoon, and it be our duty to inquire and determine how, when, and where he met his death. I needn't trouble you with a long preliminary statement as the testimony of the witnesses will supply you with the facts, and you'll be entitled to put any questions that you may wish to amplify them. <clears throat> well, we'd better begin with the discovery of the body and take events in their chronological order. Call Joseph Crick. <laughs> take the book in your right hand. You swear by Almighty God... Me and Jim Wordle have been working in the pit of filling the cart with gravel. We'd filled the last cart and seen her off and 
Then, as we're getting on for knocking off time, we lights our pipes and goes for a stroll round. I happened to notice a tree that had fell down from the top of the face. And then I, I see something lying by the tree where I've got a cap at one end and a pair of shoes at the other. It'll give me a regular start at this. So I says to Jim Wordle, I says, Jim, I says, that's a, a funny looking thing over yonder, alongside the tree, I says. So Jim Wordle, he looks at it and he says, right you are, mate. So he do. So we walked over to have a look and then we see a square of dead man. Now, oh, Inspector Barnaby, can you tell us whether you took any other measures to identify the body? Yes, sir. I checked the clothing carefully, garment by garment, by the description we issued when Mr. Lucen disappeared. And it corresponded in every respect. Then I got the caretaker from the bank to look it over. And he identified the clothes and the shoes as those worn by Mr. Lucen on the night he disappeared. Excellent. I think, gentlemen, we can take it as an established fact that the body is that of Mr. James Lucen. And now, Inspector, to return to the clothing, you've mentioned several articles found in deceased pockets. Was anything found in addition, anything of value? No, nothing, sir. Do you happen to know if deceased had any valuable property about him? Yes, sir. It's nearly certain that when he went away at about eight o'clock on the night of July the 23rd, he had on his person 100 pounds in five-pound Bank of England notes. When you say that it's nearly certain, what does that certainty amount to? It's based on the fact that after he'd gone, bank notes to that amount were found to be missing from the bank. I see. And none of these was found on the body, nor any loose money? No, sir. But well, that raises an important point. The question of robbery now arises, and with it, the further question of possible murder. Can you give us any help in considering these questions? Well, sir, I'll form certain opinions, sir, but of course it's a matter of guesswork. Oh, never mind, Inspector. A coroner's court is not bound by the strict rules of evidence. Let us hear your view. Well, sir, my opinion is... The deceased met his death by accident, the night he went away. I think he fell into the pit in the dark, dislodging a lot of gravel and pulling the small tree down with him. Go on. Then I think that about a month later, some tramp found the body and went through the pockets. And when he found the notes, he cleared off and said nothing about having seen the body. Have you any specific reasons for this theory? Oh, yes, sir. There's clear evidence that the pit has been frequented by tramps. I found in it quantities of wood ash and charcoal. I also found an old billy can and a lot of rubbish and a, a quantity of chicken and rabbit bones. So you consider the possibility of robbery with murder may be ruled out? I do, sir. Uh, on the facts known to me. And uh, subject to medical evidence, of course. Exactly. You've given us valuable help, Inspector. When we hear Dr. McAlani's testimony, no doubt it will clear up any points which may still be troubling the jury. Call Dr. McAlani. Well, Doctor, I believe that you've made a careful examination of the body of deceased. Is that so? I've made a most careful examination, sir. Though as to calling it a body, I'd rather describe it as a skeleton. Certainly, Doctor. Describe it as what you like. Perhaps the remains might be the most apt description. Uh, mighty small remains by the same token, but such as they are, I have examined them with the greatest care. And did your examination enable you to form any opinion as to the cause of death? I did not. Were any of the bones fractured or injured in any way? They were not. But can you give us no suggestion as to the probable cause of death? I only suggest that a 20-foot drop into a gravel pit is a mighty probable cause of death. <laughs> There is nothing amusing in the circumstances we are discussing. But, Doctor, what you've just told us is hardly a matter of medical evidence. That's not the worst for that. Can you say definitely that the deceased did not meet his death by any kind of homicidal violence? I cannot. He might have been strangled or smothered or stabbed or had his throat cut without leaving any marks on the skeleton. If he had fallen, as the inspector suggests, what would be the immediate cause of death? Well, the most probable would be shock, contusion of the brain, or dislocation of the neck. I think we realise that the first two causes would hardly be apparent in a skeleton. But would not dislocation of the neck leave 
recognizable traces. Well, no, only if it were accompanied by a fracture of the little neck bone known as the odontide process as the axis. But there's no such fracture in this case. I look for it particularly. Then we understand that you found nothing to indicate the cause of death. That is so, sir. Does the jury wish to put any questions to the medical witness? Very well. We need not detain you any longer, Doctor. <clears throat> now, gentlemen of the jury, I need not occupy your time with a long summing up. There are certain mysterious circumstances in the case, as, for instance, how disease came to be wandering about in the wood at night. But these questions do not concern us. We have to consider only how deceased met his death. And the position of the body, as Dr. Macalano remarked, offers a pretty obvious explanation. The only suspicious circumstance was that deceased had clearly been robbed either before or after death. But you have heard the opinion of a very able and experienced police officer and the excellent reasons he gave for that opinion. So I need say no more, but will now leave you to consider your verdict. You found that interesting, Pope? Oh, deeply, Doctor. So did I. It appeared to me a fascinating study of the perverting effect on judgment of an unconscious bias created by the suggestive power of a known set of circumstances. Indeed, sir. Yes. All the evidence that has been given was true. All the inferences were sound and proper inferences. Yet the conclusion which will be arrived at will be wildly erroneous. If you say so, Doctor. Well, Sir James just fell into that pit. I expect he was drunk. He usually was by that time of night. Yes, very likely. They didn't call that nice elderly man after all. I was sure they would. So was I. You think he's another doctor? No, a lawyer. Oh, they oh. know him. No, I mean, well, not really. He, uh, I happened to meet him once. He asked me the way to some place or other and said he was a lawyer. Oh, I see. Marcus, dear, you've been so strange in your manner this afternoon. Are you sure you're not ill or worried about something? No, my dear. As a matter of fact, at this moment, I'm very relieved and happy. Relieved? Oh, that they've taken this attitude about James. Yes, so, my dear. Now there won't be any further inquiries, and none of the past need ever come to light. If you please, sir, we're agreed upon our verdict. And what is your finding, gentlemen, on the evidence that you've heard? We find that the deceased, James Newsom, met his death on the night of the 23rd of July, 1904, by falling into a gravel pit in Potter's Wood. Yes. It amounts to a verdict of death by misadventure, and a very proper verdict, too, in my opinion. I must thank you, gentlemen, for your attendance and for the careful consideration which you've given to this inquiry. And I may take this opportunity of telling you, what I'm sure you'll all be glad to hear, that the directors of Perkins Bank have generously undertaken to have the funeral conducted at their expense. Now, let's go back and have some tea, Marcus. I can do with this, can't you? I certainly can. Lots of teas, scones, honey. Those little biscuits, Mrs. Gadden. Yeah. What are they called? Cupids. Cupids. <laughs> then we'll go into the garden and plan next year's flowers. Why not this year, as it's only April? Oh, you stupid, Marcus. Because next year I might... We might... You might be in a position to tell my garden how to behave. Huh? Well, yes. Oh, Marcus, I shall miss Lavender Cottage. But I do feel so at home in the chestnuts already. And so you should, dearest. Alice, I can hardly believe it. The shadow's lifted and we're free. Good afternoon, <gasps> Mr. Potomac. Oh, oh, I'm afraid I startled you, but I, I thought you noticed me at the inquest. Yes, I, 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 I thought it was you, uh, Mr. Um, Thorndyke. John Thorndyke, and this is Mr. Polk. Oh. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, may, I, may I present Mrs. Bellard, a neighbor? That is a, a, a friend. How do you do, Mrs. Bellard? How do you do? 
I've been wondering who you were, and Mark, uh, Mr. Potomac, didn't tell me he knew you until the inquest was almost over. Oh, yes, we have met briefly. Have you a professional interest in this inquiry? Legally, I mean. Well, perhaps it would be truer to say medically. I am, uh, how would you describe the Pope? Dr. Thorndyke is one of this country's most distinguished medical legal experts, sir. Oh, indeed. And did you find it an interesting case, Dr. Thorndyke? Very. Any feature of it in particular? Well, there was such a wealth of curious matter that I find it difficult to single out any one point in particular. It reminded me somewhat of another case in which I was personally involved. Uh, perhaps you will call it, Pelton. The curious history of Mrs. Angelina Froude, Doctor? Correct. And it recalled to me even more another most remarkable case, which was told me in great detail by a legal friend of mine. Indeed. What were the special features in that case? Well, it was a singular affair altogether. My friend used to refer to it whimsically as the, um, the case of the dead man who was alive and the live man who was dead. <sighs> Sounds like a contradiction. It does, I know. Uh, Mr. Potmack, an idea has occurred to me. I feel sure... Some instinct tells me that you would be deeply interested in the details of this case. It's a long story and highly confidential. W would you like to hear it? Yes. Then uh, um, I suggest we adjourn to some place where we can discuss it in strict privacy. I do apologize, Mrs. Bernard, but um, I'm sure you will understand. Yes, of course. If I may suggest it... Bolton here will be delighted to escort you to the Tudor Rose Tea Room, a most respectable establishment, which I recall is in Church Street, and um, there entertain you tea. Am I right, Bolton? I shall be charmed, Doctor. That's very kind of you. Come and see me this evening, Marcus. It, it, it isn't bad news, is it? No, dear. Don't worry, Alice. Alice, I love you so much. Well, shall we be going... Where do you suggest, Mr. Potomac? Perhaps you'd care to take tea with me in my garden. There we can be quite alone. Oh, I accept with great pleasure. Uh, Pelton, you will find me with Mr. Potomac at the Chestnuts uh, 20 minutes before the 5.30 London train. Very good, sir. An excellent idea of yours, Mr. Potomac. I shall be re-entering that very gate through which I had the fortune to make your acquaintance so many months ago. I was just admiring your sundial, Mr. Potomac. It is completely settled on its plinth now, I see. Yes, quite. Oh, it's a great adornment of this lovely garden. How do you like the motto? Hmm? Oh, let me see. I don't think I read it on my first visit. Sole orto spies dissidente pax. Hope in the morning, peace at eventide. Ah, pleasant optimistic model and new to me. Uh, should I be wrong if I were to assume there's a well underneath? No. No, there is an old well. It had been disused and covered up and I found it by accident when I was levelling the ground for the sundial. I very nearly fell into it. Ah, so you decided to put the sundial over it to prevent any accidents in the future? Yes. That would be about the latter part of last July? Um, yes, probably. Your tea, Mr. Potomac. Oh, well, uh, thank you, Mrs. Gadby. I put the rustic table on the lawn. It was rather stuffy in the summer house, I thought. Yes, and them spiders, too. There we are. Oh. I bought plenty of everything, but if you want more hot water, just call for it, sir. Yes, thank you. We will. Oh, really, your housekeeper must have thought you were entertaining a Sunday school treat instead of one aesthetic lawyer. However, I confess I'm quite hungry. May I help myself, do? Let me give you some tea. Thank you. Now, I expect you're impatient to hear about this case I mentioned. I'll begin with an outline sketch of it in the form of a plain story. Then, as you listen, you can tell me whether anything at all like it has ever come to your knowledge. Well, my experience is more limited, but I'll do my best. Good. My legal friend told me, then, the history of two men whom we will call Mr. Black and Mr. White. At the beginning of the story, they were close friends, and both were at a bank we will call Allsops. A series of forgeries occurred, and suspicion fell on Mr. White, 
the evidence against him was striking, but to my friend who heard about it much later, it was decidedly unsatisfactory. He was inclined to suspect that the crime was actually committed by Mr. Black. Was he really? However, the jury found Mr. White guilty, and he was sentenced to five years' penal servitude. After about a year, he escaped and made his way to the shore of an estuary, and there his clothes were found and footprints leading into the water. A body was washed up, and Mr. White was written off the records at Scotland Yard as a dead man. But he was not dead. No? No. No, the body was probably that of some bather whose clothes Mr. White had appropriated. Thus he was able to get away and take up a new life elsewhere under an assumed name. And for the space of 11 years, he vanishes from our story. And then? Well, that closes the section my friend calls the dead man who was alive. Tell me, have you heard of any similar case? Yes. By coincidence, I have. With a difference. The guilt of my Mr. Black was not problematical at all. He admitted it. Even boasted of it. Indeed. We must bear that point in mind. Now I come on to the case of the live man who was dead. After 11 years, Mr. White reappeared in a small country town, having apparently prospered in the interval. But here he met with a stroke of bad luck. Mr. Black was installed as manager of the branch bank in that very town. And, of course, they met. Mr. Black recognized Mr. White and began to levy blackmail. Of course, Mr. White was an ideal subject. He was quite defenseless, for he could not invoke the law by reason of his unexpired sentence. Exactly. At first, he seems to have accepted this. But eventually, he realized that there is no end to this sort of thing. The blackmailer is always ready to begin over again. At this point, my legal friend is unable to say what happened. Probably Mr. Black came to Mr. White's secluded garden to make fresh demands. At any rate, he went down Mr. White's well, dead or alive. In the case I heard of, it was accidental. He was drunk, and in the course of a fight, he fell across the opening of the well, striking his head on the brick coping and dropped down it. At all events, down the well he went... But it happened that on the earth path outside Mr. White's garden, Mr. Black had left the prints of his distinctive rubber soles, which could clearly be seen stopping at Mr. White's garden gate. Well, what was Mr. White to do? Obliterate them. Or continue them past his gate. Exactly. And this he did, by means of a plaster mould of the original prints. It would take too long to tell you how my learned friend deduced this. Suffice it that uh, he concluded, rightly, I think, that Mr. Black had gone in at that garden gate and never come out again, and that for some reason Mr. Black's own shoes were not available. Why? He had not been buried. There was not time. Then he was down the well. The well which my friend had gathered stood below the sundial in Mr. White's garden. He took it for granted, did he? No. No, he looked it up on an old map. And when he noticed a sack of plaster of Paris outside Mr. White's workshop and saw the skill with which he handled tools, wearing spectacles with plain glass in them, he knew how the footprints had been made. Hmm. Your friend seems to have been singularly thorough in his investigations. Oh, he was. He traced back Mr. Black's history and it led to Mr. White. He pursued cause and effect until they showed him exactly why Mr. White, assuming he was alive, should want Mr. Black out of the way. He ascertained that Mr. White was alive by taking his fingerprints to Scotland Yard. And they identified them? Not as those of a living man. My friend was very cautious. And what action did your friend take? At this stage, none. He considered it perfectly clear that Mr. White ought never to have been a convict at all. As to the killing of Mr. Black, that might well have been accidental, as in your case it was. The law offered Mr. White no protection, no remedy, and my friend thought him right to have protected himself as best he could. But then, of course, 
the alleged body of Mr. Black turned up. Yes. This put my friend in a very difficult position. Even if it were not Mr. Black's body, it was someone's body. And it seemed to imply a previous crime. So your friend attended the inquest? Yes. And very relieved he was to find that the body was no more nor less than that of an Egyptian mummy. But how did he know that? Because the finger and toenails were stained with henna. The ethmoid bones bore signs of the embalming process and uh, one or two further signs. Dear me. And Mr. White thought he was so clever. So indeed he was. But one thing my legal friend could not understand was this. Why did Mr. White put the mummy there at all? Because Mr. Black had married by trickery the girl whom Mr. White loved and who loved him. Because Mr. White had found her again on his return to England. Still married to Black, but separated from him and being done for money by him. Because, even when the shadow of the blackmailer was lifted from Mr. White, he still could not marry her, so long as Black was thought to be alive. I see. My friend never thought of that. Tell me, did the lady recognize Mr. White when they met again? I think she recognized something in him. I don't know how much. Perhaps she knew him altogether. The ways of women are beyond me, Mr. Potomac. Well, as I was saying, with the discovery of the mummy, my friend's interest in the case came to an end. But you haven't finished your story. Why, uh, what have I forgotten? You haven't told me what became of Mr. White. I think we can read from your sundial his history in a nutshell. What? Where? At the going down of the sun, peace. He married his old love and lived happy ever after. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thondark. That was Anthony Nichols as Dr. Thorndyke, and Peter Cook as Marcus Potomac in Mr. Potomac's Oversight, adapted by Molly Hardwick from the novel by R. Austin Freeman. The rest of the cast was as follows. Poulton, Will Layton. Gallet, Harold Reese. 